Yeah. That song always makes me want to dance. <laughs> As you can see, Robert, um, we're here <laughs> on Women and Stars with the Cosmic Mama and the and, and Terry Smith, an interdimensional partner, uh, Robert Martin. You're sideways. You don't know what happened? You got to unmute, too. Okay. Okay, there you go. You can hear me? Yeah. I don't know why. Let me try this. Yeah, but there you go. There you go. All right. You, you can just. So you gotta your turn your, your phone magic. around. No, 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 no. It's good. Don't now, touch right? it. Any, don't touch anything. Any again. Okay. okay. Our multi-dimensional friend here. Stop doing magic. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> um, Robert, I am so glad. I believe this is your first interview. Well, um, we met yeah. at the Journey to the Truth conference. And I've just been witnessing some of your mystical encounters lately, even when it comes to animals and sightings and stuff. And you're starting a trend of coming out of the closet yep. and sharing with the people of the world, your friends and your friend list about your experiences. And it's trickling down to create a uh, bravery and more outings <laughs> yep. among our friends. And I just want to thank you for that because it, it takes a lot. Yeah, I'm not even sure why at this point, because aliens have been on TV, all, you know, robots, aliens, space travel. Um, the first thing I would ask you is why did you do it? Why did you come out of the closet? Well, um, just recently there's been so many, uh, so much activity that has happened to me in the sky that I just, uh, I felt like it was time, like I had to do it. Um, it's been a long time coming, I know that. And this is my first real interview, but I've done some lives with Journey to Truth where mm -hmm. I just told, to, where I just told like a story of something that happened to me. Uh, but yeah, this is my first real uh, full interview. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. It's all about you tonight. Yep. So, um, what even prompted me was not just hearing some of your stories, but your amazing level of positivity during this and the way that you've connected your mindset. Mm -hmm. Because people have stories, but they don't always have a positive mindset. And that's what I noticed about you to be different because you're on the path of what I see as a person who is literally creating their life okay. and hanging on to the joy timeline. And that is something really important that me and Terry always like to find out how do you get to this place of peace? Because that's something that listeners that may be struggling in their own life, this is something that can impact them. So I just feel that it was important for you to be here with us. Um, one of the first things I would ask is when, what was your upbringing like? Like, was this, you know, extraterrestrials or metaphysics? Was that a part of your upbringing at all? What was childhood Robert like? Yeah, there was, um, not very often throughout my life, but uh, there's been experiences that I've had starting at a young age and they've been spread out, you know, many years in between. Um, and, you know, it was hard to talk to people about this stuff. So I kept most, most of it to myself because people would just think I was crazy when I started telling them I saw UFOs or I had an outer body experience or something. People just, uh, you know, just stopped listening really so um you know i kind of was closed up for many years and then um starting in 2015 uh you know i went through the dark night of the soul before that uh, and then i started on the healing path i started going to retreats and i just went to uh retreat after retreat i got addicted to that and started doing some major healing and then that's when i started seeing activity every year there was 
uh, significant, crazy uh, you, stories. Uh, you know, the lights I've seen in the sky, just you just can't explain. And so the more I've worked on myself, the more activity that I've seen in the sky as like a result. But, um, you know, I so, saw my, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You said you saw your first. Yeah, I saw my first UFO when I was like seven years old. And um, around the same age, I had an encounter with the ghost. Uh, I didn't see one, but I just heard some noises. And, you know, I can describe all the detail, but um, that's kind of where it started. Um, uh, although when I was four years old, I do remember lying in bed and just looking up at the ceiling and feeling like I'm being watched, like not just feeling, but knowing that I'm being watched by many beings and feeling like, like life is a test. And I was only like three or four years old. Well, because you said that it just made me have this image of like if someone could peel off your roof and you were inside a little Barbie house, the little faces are looking down at you. Yeah. This type of sensation. Yeah. That's what it felt like. Like there was many, you know? Yeah. It makes and me think of the, the Truman show. Did you ever see that movie? Oh yeah. Oh Jim yeah. Gary, yeah. How like he was a part of a movie set, but didn't know it. That's kind of the way I felt. And when that movie came out, I was, it made me think of, um, you know, that moment when I was really young. Yeah, like you're in your own ant farm and they're watching you. But <laughs> yeah. can I can yeah. I ask you this, though? Did you build any hypothesis? Because I know even as children, we build a hypothesis. This is why this is happening to me. Had you, as a child, built up your own belief system of I'm being watched, I'm yeah. being protected? What, what, what hypothesis did you come up with as a child? I mean, just just that, that I know that I'm being watched. You know, I know this is a test. I kind of just took that with it's me my test. whole life and, and I never forgot. So, yeah. It's a test. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's more than that, but that was, you know, a full perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Terry. So, so have you had direct contact? Like, have you... Uh, like through dreams or out of body experiences, or I know you've you've seen uh, you know objects and stuff, but have you had those those um, encounters? I'm gonna say um, don't go there with, yet because I want to go through the childhood experiences first. Okay, okay. Um, where, where did, you, she's you, like, you, gonna okay. alive, She's gonna eat you. So anyway, no. It's good. That's okay. <laughs> Don't but um, right to the climax. Yeah, climax. Yeah, those yeah. are good. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so you had that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back. Did you have Did you have any encounters when you were little? Yeah. Um, I think just so. seeing lights, lights in the did sky. Did you have dreams when you were little? Um. But, uh, you know, to be honest, I got to go through my list here and check. But, well, go through um, your dreams, list and do it yeah. your way. And then we'll just yeah. ask you the questions from off your list. And I don't mind doing that. Yeah, I've had lots of dreams. Um, and that's why I believe I was part of the SSP as well, because especially since 2015, I've had just countless dreams of being in some kind of a mission, uh, being like a men in black and, and protecting people, even uh, traveling through time in my dreams with all this detail. And it just would happen over and over and over and over again so many times that it just can't be a coincidence. So dreams, yeah, I've had lots of dreams. Uh, mm -hmm. I've had premonitions. Um, I, I lived in New Jersey previously. Now I'm in uh, near Sedona, Arizona. But when I lived in New Jersey, I would travel up north to New York, to the city. And I worked in the city sometimes and in North Jersey. But I'd always see the New York skyline, you know, when the Twin Towers were there. And I would have reoccurring dreams at that time of driving up north and not seeing the Twin Towers and seeing a different skyline. So all that, you know, many times before 9-11. So then continue through your list. You saw your first UFO at age mm -hmm. seven, you said. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that, 
Yeah, I've had an outer body experience yeah. where um, I just was like, I was sleeping and then my body was floating above the bed, uh, like vertically, and I had my arms out. It was like not this. so great today. <laughs> yeah, and I just felt like Jesus Christ. I just felt like euphoric and I can see nothing but white. Everything was white. When I look up, down, all around me, everything was white. And I was like, <sighs> Uh, kind of like that where you know it may sound like i was struggling to breathe but it, i wasn't it just felt good it was euphoric oh euphoric well that's not the ebenezer scrooge no um that was um the ghost that i saw when i was like uh, or i felt um i was like in second grade seven years old and oh. i heard we lived in an apartment, a two family house. We lived upstairs. And so you had to park in the back and then walk in the door and then go straight up these wooden creaky stairs. And so I heard something coming up the stairs in the middle of the night. And, and you can tell they were trying to be quiet, but the stairs were too noisy and creaky. Uh, and I heard chains being dragged like mm -hmm. metal chains, like slowly being dragged. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And then um, I heard something, whatever it was, come to the top of the stairs where there's another door. And then they never came inside. And then they never went back downstairs either. And I did not fall asleep for a really long time. I, I was too scared to even get up and go into my parents' room. But it makes me think of like Ebenezer Scrooge and Scooby-Doo, where they had ghosts with chains on them. Yeah. And, and you know, that, you know, is like sim symbolic to, um, you know, when people in life, they have a hard time of letting things go. Mm -hmm. um, so when you pass, you know, then they're kind of like stuck here uh, with unfinished business and they're like chained down. So there's like a realness to this. I, I'd like to, you know, talk to the guy who wrote Ebenezer Scrooge and say, hey, where did you come up with that ghost with the chain? Is there something real to that that they've heard? Probably. So at that time, had you ever informed your parents at all? Yeah, I told them about that. And, you know, there's not much they can do about it. Right. Was there any... Uh, resonance with them of did they have any stories where they said you know I remember when that happened to me or did they no nah. nah, no confirmation <laughs> no no nobody else in my family has uh, had any strange experiences uh, except my sister she did uh, see a ghost in the house when we were like teenagers that's a, or that's so that's further along yeah so then so then after that there was your archangel experience. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I was told by a channeler that it was an archangel and I believed it. It sounds believable. Um, but what happened to me was I was in a heavy uh, state of fear and I was like 10 years old. And so I, I hear people telling stories, uh, ghost stories all the time. And so I, I believed in it. It sounded real to me. And, um, you know, I know I heard a ghost before at that time. So I just was in the state of fear one night and um, I woke up in the middle of the night and it was pitch black. I usually, you know, would tell my father to leave the hall light on or something and he would turn it off anyway when he would go to bed. And I'd wake up petrified because, you know, I, I have always been sensitive my whole life and I do see things, I, I, especially as a child, but I would never focus on it. I would always block it out, close my eyes or turn the light on. I didn't want to see anything, but there were things that I did see. I can see energies and different colors just, you know, in just one second of looking. Um, so this one night I woke up and I, I uh, opened my eyes and there was a being like behind my bed and leaning down and looking straight down at me. And it was this creepiest, scariest thing that, you know, I've ever experienced. And um, so I threw the covers over my head and I began to pray. And all, all I remember is that, is that I just started to pray. I don't remember anything else. And there's no way that I fell back asleep. There's, it's just not possible. So I believe that whatever this being was, whether it was an archangel or just a spirit or something, I believe he said, 
or it said, whoa, I just screwed up here. I'm trying to, you know, be here to protect this guy. And I just scared the crap out of him more. So I think he went and just put me to sleep because the next thing I know it was morning, I woke up. So uh, oh, wow. I was told by a channeler, um, Pamela Erlin, she's on YouTube. Uh, I had a couple of readings done from her and, you know, any kind of reading you get from someone, it's not going to be 100% accurate. Everyone has their own filter that, you know, they could uh, misinterpret something. Uh, and so so I always asked people, uh, channelers, a few questions that I already knew the answer to. And so she always answered these questions correctly. And um, so she told me, and I didn't tell her any of the story. I just, you know, didn't tell her anything of, of what, you know, I experienced. I just said... I saw a being when I was 10 years old in my room one night, and, and what was it? And she immediately said it was Archangel Azriel. And Azriel is one of the many angels of death. And, you know, it sounds scary, but, um, you know, these angels of death, if you think about it, you have to be a really special angel uh, to help people transition from dying. Um, so... Uh, and this angel is also the angel of protection. And so when she said that, then it made sense to me that that angel was there, you know, not to take me, my life, but to protect me. Um, what are your thoughts on archangels? Like, uh, have you had more experience with archangels or? Um, nothing like that. But I, that you I, kind of follow or you just... This yeah, I've, I've read a lot about there. There's actually a book by Archangel Azriel that, you know, you can find. It's a short book that's supposedly written by by that Archangel. Um, and I had a connection with other uh, when I would listen to uh, Pamela Erlin, she channeled higher dimensional beings. So you can go to your her YouTube and she channels like Yeshua, Mary and all these other Archangels and Metatron. And uh, so I would listen to all these uh, these videos and uh, just absorb all the information. And uh, and sometimes after that, I can even hear their messages right right in my head and be guided by them. It doesn't happen that often, but there are occasions where I heard a clear voice uh, guiding me and uh, telling me to do this or that. So how did you end up with the Jersey Devil? I'm just well, learning about that from a TV show. What 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 they do in the shadows? I think that show about the vampire show. And I heard about the Jersey Devil, but uh <laughs> Yeah. <Jersey Devil. laughs> The Jersey Devil is kind of popular. They have a hockey team named after them, the, the uh, you know professional hockey team, the Jersey Devils. And uh, so there's many stories that I've heard growing up uh, in the Pine Barrens of people seeing like a winged creature. And, and you know, to be honest, there's so many stories from so many different people uh, and there's all different kinds of beings that are really out there. Whether I was gonna say in Jersey, they got quite a few hauntings and a few, quite a, mm -hmm. a lot going on in, in Jersey. Yeah, don't yeah. they? Yeah, and you know, I'm not sure if it was the Jersey devil, but it was definitely something unusual. And uh, another thing that I suspect um, is it could have been Bigfoot possibly. Um, so I'll just tell you the story. Uh, I was like 15 years old and I was with two of my friends around the same age and we were out late at night, you know, two o'clock in the morning or something. And we weren't being bad, but I guess we were making noise and someone called the police on us and we seen the cop car from a distance and the cop just nailed the gas. And, and so we got scared. So we just started running and we ran through the uh, property of where we were hanging out. And there was a large uh, plot of woods right behind the house we were hanging out. So we just ran into the woods and just ran uh, through the field uh, to the other side of the uh, the edge of the woods and then we just uh, were behind a bush and we looked back and we can see the cop was walking through the trail and he had a flashlight and he just eventually gave up and and went back to his car but as this is going on as he's still walking uh, looking for us we saw in the distance not too far these red eyes maybe about five to six feet above the ground and you can see the eyes moving and they're so like they were walking 
right? But you could not hear a sound. Uh, it, there, there was no moon out. Uh, it was cl cloudy, so there was no stars, and you couldn't see anything. You couldn't. I, we couldn't see a silhouette of whatever this thing was. We could see nothing except two red eyes. And there's no lights from anything to, you know, when you um, your headlights shine on a deer and it makes their eyes glow. Well, there was no lights in the area to make this thing's eyes glow. They were just naturally glowing red, which is very scary. And so uh, the woods were and the field was kind of shaped like a horseshoe. So it was walking around the edge of the woods and then just coming around this horseshoe. And then now he's coming straight at us. And by this time, the cop was walking the other direction. The two, the three of us just got up and ran as fast as we could. So, you know, I'm not really sure what it was, but we just assumed it was the Jersey Devil. <laughs> Let me see. Where is Sleepy Hollow? That I think that's interesting because it made me think about Ichabod Crane since you said, I don't know. <laughs> Um, right. Did you know that Ichabod Crane was from, he's from, oh my gosh, Elizabethtown, New Jersey? Oh, no, I didn't. That's funny. Yeah, I know right where that, where that is. That's up north, not too far from New York City. <laughs> I wonder if the Jersey Devil is really, um, what, what is that? The Headless Horseman type thing. But yeah. you saw eyes. Headless oh, Horseman. Yeah. Yeah, no, he didn't have a pumpkin on his head that he tried to throw at us or nothing like that. <laughs> but, no, uh, I'm not even making fun, but I just, I don't know. I kind of, it makes me wonder. Yeah, um, I mean, who knows? I, I think it could have been Bigfoot or the Jersey Devil. It could have been neither. Who really yeah, knows? Um, but I suspect the Bigfoot because I, I've done some research about Bigfoot because I did have a couple of Bigfoot experiences. And um, from what I found out, there was other people who have claimed that they saw him and they had red glowing eyes. So right. it's possible. It's possible. I didn't see Robert Earl's research, but I know he went to West Virginia to see the Mothman. I don't know. Did you ever see that? No, nah, but Mothman. I heard about it. Yeah, I read the about Mothman it. Mothman Prophecy. Yeah, it's an interesting That's story. That's another good one. I totally believe that one. I totally yeah. believe yeah, um, So then... There's the DNA upgrades that you encountered. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was uh, the, hold on a second. That was the outer body experience. Oh, I, okay. I, I was thinking, you know, what was it? Why was it happening? And so I felt like it must have been a DNA upgrade. And because I, I have had lots of, you know, strange experiences with you know UFOs and stuff. And so when I had uh, some channelings done, I, I would ask them, like, why are these things happening to me? What What is going on? And so some of them said, you know, a lot of times when you see UFO or something or maybe floated above your bed that you're getting a DNA upgrade. What did it feel like to you, though? What was it? It was the best DNA upgrade I ever had. <laughs> it, just, it felt great, you know. And uh, there, there were other times where, um, you know, I was told by the channeler that I had a DNA upgrade, but I didn't necessarily feel anything, you know. So, right. You, you know, in the old days, there's lots of stories of people being abducted and then being traumatized. So now I heard that, you know, they advanced and they can just you know, do it etherically. They can upgrade you or, or do whatever. They don't have to uh, abduct your physical body anymore. So this was maybe a pointed time, a t an appointed timeline where your guides come in? Like who who's doing the upgrades? Like, is it your ET family, your guides, your... Ooh. Yeah, I mean, it could be all of the above. I could only speculate. I, I do mm -hmm. believe it's definitely connected to my ET guides um, and Star Family. Um, there was one time I saw like a ball of fire in my backyard. It's on the list here somewhere. Wow. Um, yeah, it was 2013. And it was literally a ball of fire uh, and it was going really slow. So it wasn't like it was shooting through the sky really fast. And uh, my neighbor was there. Um, I have him as a witness. Uh, he was 11 years old at the time. He's 21 now or something. Um, but he saw it first. I was uh, 
covering a root on the ground with some dirt and I was just patting the dirt down and uh, and the funny thing was too I was listening to this guy named Riley Martin and he was uh, abducted by aliens and had some stories so here I am listening to someone um, who's telling stories about you know when the UFO experiences they had and then here I see this UFO my neighbor he was like uh, he was respectful. His mom told me, uh, told him to call me Mr. Rob, right? So he was like, Mr. Rob, I, there's a UFO. And of course, I believe in them, but I just <laughs> didn't, didn't think it was really a UFO. I just figured it was an airplane, and I just kept doing what I was doing. But I was almost done anyway. And so by the time I was done and about to stand up, he, he said it again, but more intensely. He's like, Mr. Rob, there's a UFO. And so I looked up, and I was like, holy shit. There's like a ball of fire just floating really slow over my neighbor's house. It was a close encounter. It was less than 500 feet. And uh, we just watched it until it drifted out of sight. But it looked like a crystal ball, maybe the size of a small car. And there was a flame all the way around it. And there was a flame on top, you know, dancing like a flame does. And it, it wasn't going in a perfect straight line. It was kind of doing an arc, you know. But it never went higher or lower. It just kind of did a did an arc like that. And I just watched it till it went out of distance. What was going on in your life during the time that was ha that happened? I mean, you were listening to UFO information. It's 2013. It's right after the 2012 wave. What what was life? What was happening in your life at that time? Or well, what I part of the world know. were you living in? Yeah, I was in New Jersey, and uh, just a year before my uh, stepfather passed away, and so we. Uh, we inherited the house that um, that he left. So I was only in that house for like a year at the time when they had that experience. But, you know, I don't know of any other connection. Um, but uh, a couple of years before that, just before I moved into that house, I did have a time travel experience in 2011. And that was really, you know, remarkable. <laughs> and what, what do you mean time travel? What is your... <laughs> Well, I traveled two months into the future and then went back in the same night, uh, but I was not aware that I traveled. All right. So what happened was I was in my room and I was in Island Heights, New Jersey, and um, I was watching TV. I uh, had the Yankee game on the, the baseball team, the Yankees, and I was on my laptop at the same time. And so uh, after a little while, I fell asleep. I, I dozed off and uh, then I woke back up whatever an hour or, or two later and um, I was watching the, the Yankees. They were the game was over and they were saying, oh, the Yankees hit, uh, you know, a home run and a grand slam and another grand slam. And they scored 22 runs. And they said this is the most runs that the Yankees ever scored in Yankee Stadium. And that number at the time, 22, was coming up a lot. It was It's a master number in numerology. And I since discovered that my life path number is a 22, which is like a master builder, it says. And that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a builder. So that kind of blew me away when I discovered that. So I already had a list in my phone of anything unusual with the number 22 in it, I already had a list of unusual things. So I said, oh, I'm going to write that down in my phone. The most the Yankees ever scored uh, and, and the date, whatever the date was in 2011, because I thought that was unusual because the Yankees, you know, have a history of uh, winning all, the most World Series, uh, more championships than any sport. And uh, they Back in the day, they had Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio and so many more. I'm like, I, they never scored 22 runs until 2011. You know, it was just kind of odd to me. And so, you know, the night was un uneventful. Um, I just went back to sleep, never left my room. So about two months went by and then the same thing happened. I was sitting in the same spot watching the Yankee game again and I had my computer on. And so I dozed off. And when I woke up, I woke up to the same moment that I woke up to two months prior. And I, I know the game wasn't a replay, 
Like if it was uh, a replay, they would have a little icon telling you that it's a replay and not a live game. I knew when I dozed off, I was watching a live game. And so I woke up and they're saying the same thing that I heard two months prior. And the guy goes and the Yankees scored 22 runs and it's the most runs that they ever scored in Yankee Stadium. And I'm like, man, that sounds like a recording and I'm watching a live game. And I'm and I was waiting for him to say, and they did it two months ago. And he didn't say that. So I, I immediately suspected something. Um, I've had premonitions before. I've had dreams where I woke up and then the dream came true, like as soon as I woke up, right? Just little things, insignificant, but significant enough be, to know that it's a premonition and premonitions are real. You can really see into the future. So I just assumed, man, I, I had a dream and, and a premonition or something and, uh, you know, two months prior. Uh, so I went on the Yankees website and I looked to see if there was another game that they scored 22 runs and there wasn't. So now I really, you know, I'm leaning towards some kind of premonition. And then I remembered that I wrote it down in my phone. So I was wondering, is it going to be there? When I look in my phone, is it just not going to be there? And if it is there, what does that mean? So I looked in my phone and the notes were there that I wrote down. And so, you know, I did ask Chandler's about that. And, you know, what Pamela Erwin said to me was, well, oh, that's a sixth dimensional thing to do. She said, you bio-located. Like I was there physically in, two months into the future with my phone in a bubble or something. And, you know, like I said, I never left the house. If I only knew, I would have, you know, went and got the, brought the lottery numbers with me or something. But, you know, uh, so there's. Or you would have the, bet on the game. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> something. You know? Yeah. But uh, so the, there's one other thing. So um, a day or two later, I was talking to my son. And he said, hey, dad, you never asked me about the Yankee game that I went to. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. You were saying you were going to a Yankee game with Pop-Pop Joe. How was it? And he goes, oh, it was great. They scored 22 runs. I said, get the fuck out of here. You were at that game. And he was like, yeah. So I traveled two months into the future to see this game for some reason that, you know, my son was at my stepfather who passed away the next year after that and my uh, father-in-law, so they were there. It's reminding me of this movie Frequency. Terry, I know you got something. <laughs> it's just, you're floored, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's all right. I got some more things that I can say about the time travel because you know, after that happened to me, I mean, imagine if something like that happened to you, you're just going to go on living life like normal. No, I became obsessed with information and I was on the computer every night for literally years after that, not just because of the time travel, but, you know, when you go onto the computer and you start discovering truth, then you find more truth and more truth. And, you know, that's why I am where I am today, you know, going to these conferences and stuff like that. I'm a rebel of disclosure. <laughs> but um, so there's lots of things I learned about uh, time travel and the pineal gland, okay, which is in the center of your brain. It's, uh, it's connected to pine, like some people pronounce it pineal gland, but I say pine, pineal gland. Um, there's um, the Anunnaki have been seen with like pine cones. There's depictions of them with pine cones in their hand and doing something with it. And there's a statue, a big giant statue of a pine cone in the Vatican. And um, your pineal gland is a stargate and a time machine. And um, the Egyptians knew it. And uh, if you take the Egyptians had depictions of they would take a brain, slice it in half. And then you look at the profile and it looks like right where the pineal gland is. It looks like the eye of Horus. So like you don't learn that in school, right? You don't, they don't teach you that in school because they don't want you to know that stuff. They don't want you to know that you have a stargate and a time machine right in your head. <laughs> so uh, like, I've never heard that before until I started doing this research. And um, so the eye of Horus is connected to the pineal gland and your third eye. Okay. It's your third eye is your pineal gland. And um, 
and the, and they say it looks like a pine cone. There's like scales or something on it, but it also has uh, um, crystals. It has piezoelectric mm -hmm. crystals that you know make this possible. And DMT is released naturally from the pineal gland when you go to sleep. And also, they call it the third eye because it has rods and cones on it. The only other thing that has rods and cones are your two eyes. So that's why they call it the third eye. So just, um, <clears throat> it's interesting because uh, during the, um, during the COVID pandemic, they wanted people to, uh, to test Right, so what were they doing? They were putting these big things up your nose, right? Mm. It was actually, um, yeah. There's a membrane in the back there, yep. and yeah, um, they were they were breaking know, the blood they, membrane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also they they say that there was certain graphene and stuff on some of those. Whether there was or there wasn't, I don't know, but they were putting it into that area to they don't want us to be awake and right. as soon as you awaken when as soon as you decalcify your pineal gland um then you start to awaken and certain certain agendas don't want that yeah. right with the chloroquine too that those were agents all the things that were recommended the medicines that they took off the market were all the medicines that would literally decalcify your heart and your Pineal gland. So. Your, your pineal. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. And there's a lot of and 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 the floor and the floor uh the fluorinated water um yep. it calcifies the pineal gland. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yep, any kind of metal, any kind of heavy metal will calcify it. Yeah. And just dis disrupt our body functions. You know, any kind of metals. That's why they do it in the chemtrails. There's all heavy metals in the chemtrails. You know, and they, they say they're doing it for climate change, but I don't know how heavy metals, you know, helps climate change. Yeah. The, the, the crystal, the crystal that forms in the pineal is, uh, I believe it's magnetite. Okay. Is it, is the type of crystal that, that forms. Okay. Yeah. Lots of things we can do, lots of things to work on um, getting that cleared up. So yeah. had you gone through a decalcification process? Is that? No, I haven't. I, I mean, there there have been things I've done, but I don't even recall. I don't have any good advice for that right now. On, uh, no problem. Do it. But yeah, that is a good thing to do is to work on decalcifying our, all of our pineal glands. Stop taking fluoride. Don't use fluoride in toothpaste. Drink spring water, not purified water. Drink spring water, natural spring water. And so when would you say, I guess, 20, 20, 2015, you still weren't in retreat mode. You still weren't what was going on around 2015 before your divine intervention? Yeah, that, well, that's kind of, um, you know, 2015 was, I call my breakout year. Okay. Um, you know, there's different things that happened that year. Um, my daughter went missing. Uh, she was addicted to drugs and um, she signed herself out of a rehab uh, and just didn't, uh, stay in contact with us we lost contact with her and um you know i can i can tell that story now too but it at that point you know i was at my lowest in my life uh my my ex-wife was also addicted to drugs and i'm talking about the worst kind i'm talking about heroin and um so you know i went through a dark night of the soul that lasted many nights uh, years actually and it was like 10 15 years of darkness that i went through mm -hmm. and uh even though uh, my wife and i were were separated and i still 
uh, took care of my family as best as I could and didn't make time to be with anyone else. I just didn't want them to, I didn't want to lose any of them. You know, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if anything happened to, you know, my children or their mother. And so I just dedicated my life to, to trying to get them right. And so, you know, 2015, when my daughter went missing, um, I was literally not contemplating suicide. I was already going to commit suicide. I was contemplating the easiest way to die with the least amount of pain. And then she went missing. And so I couldn't go down like that. I, I had to do something about, you know, her missing. And, you know, I was out of it mentally. And it took me a while to get my head together just to even go down to Florida where she was missing and look for her. And um, so, <clears throat> So, I mean, I'm writing my book and a lot of these details will be in my book because I'm not going to remember all of them. But um, I do remember it took me two weeks to get down to Florida, you know, and, you know, now if anything happened, I'd be there in a minute. But I was just so out of it. I just didn't have it in me to uh, do what was right right away. And uh, so after um, about a week or so, um, my friend invited me to church and so i went to um a christian church in new jersey and i listened to um a person who uh was a friend of mine that the pastor uh isaac and when i was listening to him that day i felt like i was the only one in church i i felt like he was just talking to me and everything that he was saying just meant so much to me i just felt like the only one in the room and uh, what he talked about was worthy is the lamb. And I used to be able to quote 10, 15 different things that he said at, at the time that I would just repeat. It just inspired me, you know, so much. And it helped light a fire in me that went out. And um, I felt worthy that I could have a good life too. And so when I walked out of there, I was floating on air and I knew that I had to go to Florida and try to find my daughter. And uh, so that was on a Sunday. I bought a plane ticket uh, on Monday and uh, the flight wasn't until Thursday uh, late at night. And so I flew down and by the time I arrived, it was Friday morning at one o'clock in the morning. And my friend Tom, he... Um, he drove all the way across the state from the west coast of Florida. I was going to Fort Pierce, Florida, which is on the east coast, but that's where I landed in West Palm Beach. So we had to drive three hours back to his house. And then um, the next morning, his his wife and, and Tom, they made me breakfast and they gave me this extra car. They're like, here's the keys. It's an extra car. You know, we have our own cars. Take it as long as you need it. And when you find her, you can drive her home in it, whatever you have to do. So I was really grateful. So I left about 9 a.m. in the morning and I was due to arrive uh, back on the East Coast in Fort Pierce, Florida around noon. Well, at noon, I arrived with my daughter in my arms and uh, I never had to look for her. Wow. It was it was divine intervention that for the timing of, um, you know, we made a post on Facebook when she went missing and we were reposting it every day and people were sharing it. There was thousands of shares and I didn't know how many friends I had in the Fort Pierce, uh, Florida area until this happened and they all were helping in whatever way they could. And my friend Michelle, she worked at an office building and her boss said she can print out as many flyers, you know, as I needed. And it was, uh, you know, a picture of my daughter and a description of what she looked like and um, and a phone number, contact information. And um, so, uh, you know, there was people already handing flyers out before I even got down there. So um, as I was maybe an hour away from Fort Pierce, uh, there was a tip that came over Messenger. Someone said that they thought they saw her on the corner of whatever road in Fort Pierce. So I was going to meet this woman named Margaret, who was a local journalist. And um, 
we were going to go to the beach and she had a bunch of flyers and we were just going to hand out flyers at the beach and just start there. And I never had to do that. So I called her and I said, Hey, she was seen on this corner road. And she was like, Oh, I'm only 10 minutes from there. I'll drive over there. So she drove over there and she was handing out flyers and she uh, handed a flyer to a young man and said, have you seen this girl? And uh, he said, yeah, she's actually staying in the same house I'm staying in and the house is right there. And here's the phone number to the man of the house. And so she called me. I was like, I found her. And I was like, holy shit. And uh, so I called, left a message. Uh, I text and I didn't hear back. And so um, and so uh, she must have called her mother. And so, um, you know, my ex calls me and she's like, you know, Brittany just called me, you know, like she's alive, like, holy shit. And and I was like, wow, what did she say? And she said, how the fuck does dad know where I'm at? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, like, it's funny now, you know, can laugh at it now. Right. I was not right. in the laughing mood that day. And so right. I said, okay, I said, okay, I, I get it. They, they think I'm just there to, you know, drag her out of the house and kill everybody and, and take her back home which is what I wanted to do, but you know, it's not gonna work. It's not a good strategy, right? She's uh, t was 20 years old, 22 years old at the time. So, you know, I, I couldn't enforce, you know, any parental rights. Right. So, you can't even with the police, you can't really even no, call a no, person no. missing that's over 18, right? Right, yeah. So yeah. I did call the police because, you know, she was reported missing. Right. And so um, I met the police at the house and they went inside and checked it out and made sure everything was safe. And it was. And uh, and so he left. And then, you know, when my daughter came out, you know, she hugged me right away. And it was, uh, you know, a great uh, reuniting. Um, but, was she was she uh, just trying to do something different or? Sort of. <laughs> she had a new drug of choice um, down there. It was crack. And uh, so she was now using that and she didn't want to uh, contact anybody. She right. you know, didn't want to uh, enter the same life that she had. She did want, you know, a, a, a new a new way, I guess. But, you know, it was really rough for us that two weeks because, you know, when when uh, heroin addicts go clean for a little while and they use again, many of them overdose and die because they try to use the same amount that they did previously. And so they overdose. And um, so we were afraid that that's what happened because she was in the rehab for two weeks and not using. And then all of a sudden she's gone. And um, there was another young man who went missing the same day in the same town. And a week later, he was found dead in a ditch. And so this is like what we were going through and having to deal with, like, oh, when, when are they going to find our daughter dead in a ditch? She's next, you know? And so, uh, you know, by miracle, uh, she made it through. <laughs> right. And it's, kind of, it's the actual worst thing, right, is to have someone missing because your mind fills in the blanks mm -hmm. the whole time. But... Um, Something about people that do cocaine or crack cocaine is too that for some reason they just feel so I don't know if it's humiliated or whatever it is, this thing gets in their head with these voices and tells them to hide. Yeah. And they will just, you know, I've mm -hmm. actually had a family member and I'm like, You're an adult if that's what you're, you know, I can't fix you, change you, but you don't have to hide from me. But there's something in it just it makes them regress and 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 want to just disappear and hide their face, and it's very hurtful to family members as well. So, I'm really thanking you for being so vulnerable, being able to talk about that, and it's another big part of your story that makes it so um, amazing at how your mental fortitude is been built over time. Yeah. So that now that this happened, you basically hit a breakthrough after this. Yeah. Yeah. So right after this happened, and, and there's a little more to the story, but I went on my first retreat the very next month. Yeah. 
Uh, so in August of 2015, my daughter was lost and found. And then a month later, I went to Sedona, Arizona for the first time. And I went to, uh, that was in September of 2015. And then in February, I was in Hawaii on a retreat for two weeks. And then a few months later in July, I was in Mount Shasta on a retreat and then back in Sedona again in September. So that was 13 months of four retreats, one, two, yeah, four retreats I did in 13 months. And man, I needed it because I wanted to take myself out. I was miserable. I was not happy, did not feel worthy at all. And I discovered that's a, a big problem in this world is that people, you know, they lack self-worth. And so I constantly try to peak, uh, uh, preach to people and and make them you know feel better about themselves and remind them that they're divine they're divine beings and and it takes time to make people shift you know there's been friends who i've been close to and and they call me you know when they're feeling down or going through some hard times and it's taken me over a year to make you know this person start to actually believe what i'm saying you know uh, so, you know, people need to to know that, you know, that they are divine and they are magical and all these, you know, things can happen to them too, all, all these positive things. And and optimism, you know, is, is your best tool because we create our own universe. And so if that's true, then being optimistic is, you know, there's a better chance if, uh, if you're expecting, you know, the better thing to happen. And you don't want to be too detailed with your expectations. You know, you just want to throw a blanket over all expectations and just know that good things are going to happen to you. You don't want to be too specific because if you are very specific with the things that you want, you might be limited in yourself. You maybe can do better. And so just throw a blanket of wonderful expectations. Great things are going to happen. And, and I just have an inner knowing of that. I think one important part, like if you go back to church that day, you said you, you re, it was like the revelation that you do deserve a good life. Right. And that was, you know, you, and you went forward into the darkness, but then you came back to the point of, I do deserve to have a good life. And, and then you began to give it to yourself. And that's an important thing. I, I think a lot of times people would have tried to fill the energy with a new relationship, but even you, you had something to say about that as well, about giving it to yourself, mm -hmm. showing yourself that you deserve it because I guess we can seek joy from other people but that is always going to be shaky if it's relying on right. <clears throat> things. I don't know if you had anything to speak on that. Would you? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when I started going on retreats, I felt like I gave up on my family. You know, in a way I kind of did. Uh, you know, I didn't realize I was enabling them. I was saying yes to everything, you know, not just with my family, but at work. Uh, you know, I have my own business for 20 years now, but I do work, works for builders and stuff. And whenever they would say, hey, can you do this? I always said yes. I was a yes man. And I always put myself last. And so when I started going on these retreats, you know, for the first time I, in a long time, I was putting myself first. And so I, there was a guilt that I felt in the beginning uh, of that because I'm spending money. You know, maybe the money could be going to help my family or whatever, but I knew what I was doing was right because it was saving my life. And I knew that they wouldn't be very good if I took my own life and disappeared, that they would just fall apart worse. And so um, I didn't know that putting myself first would eventually help them because, you know, I all these retreats that I went to, I didn't have to come home and tell them what I've learned and show them. I didn't have to do any of that. I influenced them to start putting themselves first. And so right away, I seen healing already begin in everyone in my family who was struggling. Right away, it, like immediately, uh, there was these little, and I forget the details now, but at the time when it was happening, I can tell you exactly how this person changing, this person's changing, what they're doing different, like four or five different people in my family. 
And, and the more I went on retreats and the more I healed myself and put myself first, then, then they started to get it and realize that I was doing the right thing. And then they supported me more because in the beginning they were more resistant. Oh, you're going on vacation all the time and we're stuck at home being miserable. But now, now they know that everything that I've done, you know, was the right thing for everyone. And, you know, we're all still healing, you know, it's still a, an ongoing process, but you know, we've come a long way and, um, I think so, it's it's interesting because misery likes company, right? Yeah. So a lot of times with families, like we want everybody to stay in here with us, you know, like we don't want others to be moving forward and changing. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the mom that makes the kids feel guilty because they're going to have a life and not like, wait a minute, mom should actually be living her best life. Dad should be, they, we should all be living our best life, but it's sure. this thing of, hey, if I'm not able to think outside of the four walls or my job, which some people think this is the fullness of life is just going to work and coming home and sitting on the couch and watching TV, like that's the fullness of life and they're not even getting to live. But so you created space for the family to actually venture out into the world. Like, no, I, I want the best for you. I want you to go out there. Yeah. But um, even with you always being the overgiver, yeah, we have that saying, Terry, right? Uh, don your own face mask first. If the plane is going down, right. you gotta don your own mask first because if I'm half dead, and I can't, I can't help you. I have, I might have to have my cup full in order for me to give to you. Exactly. And we're used to giving in a state of half empty consistently and wondering why we're burnt out and drained and don't have the energy to actually love our family. Right. But um, then the last thing I'm going to say about that too is, you know, I, I remember going to church and they always talked about Jesus doing miracles and the living water. And what I find, even in your story, the living water is the words of encouragement that you get to give to someone else to lift their soul. So he said, I'm going to make a blind man see. How do you do that? When you can teach someone something and show them a different way. So now you're helping a blind man see when someone's crippled or lame in the bed and they can't get up. Their soul is so tired. You give them those words that live in water and that allows them to go. So yeah, you are doing that healing work mm -hmm. in your own life. So these are just the, uh, the observations that I have. So now since you've come to this point of breakthrough now, it's caused you to have more contact than ever before now, because I guess now we don't, you're not overworking yourself. You're not worrying all the time. Mm -hmm. Gives your mind, you know, you're in meditating also as well, or you're you're open yeah. to see what's really going on in the world around you. And maybe you want to go more into that. Yeah. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my daughter first. Um, oh, yes. Before oh, I yeah. get into some other uh, experiences. But so, you know, it was really nice that I found her and she was alive. And, you know, I did end up driving her home like my friend you know, uh, mentioned, oddly mentioned to me. Um, cause when my friend said, Hey, drive her home, if you have to, we didn't know if she was alive at that time, but he kind of must've knew something in his head about, you know, what was going to happen. Cause he just had this confidence, like drive her home when you find her, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that's ended up what happened. And, but she didn't get clean right away. Um, so, um, I, you know, was going to these retreats and, you know, was taught a lot about uh, unconditional love. I was, I would hear a lot about that. It was uh, Bridget Nielsen who would have these retreats. I went on five of her retreats, uh, four in a row, and then another one in Massachusetts a couple of years later. So you can find her on YouTube. She still hosts retreats, mostly uh, for women, but, you know, it's really great. She's done like over 40 retreats now. So, and I recently did a um, retreat training class with her recently, and that was really good. So, you know, please check her out. Um, so, um, so I was learning about unconditional love and I thought I knew what it was when I was learning about it, but it took me a couple of years to kind of really grasp it, you know, and, um, 
then one day I came home and I remember like where I, I walked into the house, where my daughter was sitting. It was a moment that I'll never forget, but I walked in the front door and my daughter was in the room to the left. And so I opened the door I can see her through the window. So I opened the door, I walked in and I was like, Hey, Brittany, how are you? And she was nodding off and she couldn't even tell where the sound was coming from. And she was like, Oh, uh, hi, I love you too. And so like I used to throw her out if she was not enough. She's a bad, you know, example for her other brothers who are living there, you know, and and yell at her and 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 say get the fuck out and what's wrong with you and put her down and that I was angry, you know, at at the world and um because my wife was addicted to drugs, my daughter was addicted to drugs. I, I just you know was miserable and and angry, and so uh, when I started uh, trying this unconditional love, I just treated her like that every time I saw her. Every time I saw her. Hey, how are you, Brittany? I love you, you know, and that's it. And about two and a half weeks later, I was walking in the door. She was sitting in the same spot as she was uh, the first time I said, uh, uh, I love you, uh, you know, when I wanted to be uh, like unconditional love. And so I opened the door. She was she got up and she came right over to me. She got right in my face and she goes, I want to go to the clinic now. She's been to rehab or the clinic six times at this point and been halfway houses and detoxed dozens of times in the hospital or at home. Takes a few days to detox. We went through a lot of that shit. But every time we would have to push her, we'd say, come on, you got to call. You got to find the place. You got to get in the place. And, you know, they would call rehabs and there wouldn't be a bed available. So you'd have to call every day and until there was a bed available. So we always had to push her to do this. This was the first time that she came to me or, or her mom. She came to one of us and said, I want to go to the clinic. So I felt something in her at that moment that I knew that she meant what she was saying. I could feel it that when she did go to the clinic after saying this, that she would be clean from that day on. And I was right, because that's it was almost seven years ago now that she's been clean. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, wow, look oh, at you. Like the fireworks. <laughs> Every time you do this, it's going to give you one of those thumbs up. It's amazing. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal yeah. because so, many times we can give up on the kids. Yeah. A lot of people are really worried about their kids and yeah. all we can do is send them love, the most love. I don't know, Terry, if you had a thought. I know we're both moms. And I know I want to. <laughs> And I want to rant about way smaller things, you know, but um, yeah, Terry, I, I, I am buffering so bad here. I'm only getting sometimes part of the conversation, but I, I am. But, but so how is she now, Robert? Oh, that's the next ten, thing I was 10 years say. later, nine years later. How is she so, doing now? So, yeah, she's doing great. Um, she actually works at a drug and alcohol rehab place now helping other addicts. And um, she's since that time she's got clean, she's received her associates and bachelor's degree and she's got her license for counseling. And she just recently was made the head counselor at the place where she works and she's going for her master's degree. So I'm kind of jealous because, you know, oh. I'm a healer too. Amazing. But, but she's helping people every day, you know, every single day she's helping people and she's just a natural at it. She's, it, it's just so natural for her. Um, I was told that she was a rainbow, which like has a, the aura color is rainbow. And um, that's definitely believable. Um, she's uh, 30 now. And um, she, uh, I know that, other counselors there who are much older than her go to her for advice because she's got the field experience you know she's been there herself not just educated from a book about addiction and so she would always have an answer like them for like that for these people who had questions of what do i do so yeah she's uh come a long way 
Any other thoughts, Terry? It's amazing. Yeah, don't count people. have done it without you. Yeah. <laughs> you can't count anybody out. The, ra the race is not over until it's actually, actually over. And then we still don't even know what goes behind the finish line. So I yeah. think it's amazing. Um, don't worry about the buffering, Terry. You're not doing too bad. You're not doing too bad. <laughs> and I don't know how you want to progress with your story. Like, um, where well, do you want to go next? I mean, the things with Bridget, Bridget has amazing retreats and she's very consistent. The class is amazing. Like even I, I signed up for the class. I haven't started it yet, but I'm looking forward to learning from yeah. Bridget as well. So that's amazing. But you yeah, built man. some amazing friendships too. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I started coming to Arizona every year after that. So 2015 was the first time, but I I visited every single year, uh, sometimes multiple times in the year until last year when I finally moved here last year. So, um, oh. but yeah, so I felt like um, people out here were like-minded. So every time I would come to this area and I would meet more local people, they were just like me, you know? So here I was in New Jersey, just, I was this anomaly where I would have all these experiences, but I never really shared that much because, you know, no one else is having experiences like that. So here I am, Sedona, and I can talk about anything at any time. And the con then started to go into conferences, and it was the same way. I got addicted to going to conferences. So um, I, I love to share these stories. And there's so many stories that I even forgot about, and that's why I make this list now because I wouldn't tell these stories, and so I would even forget about them. And it took years to remember all of these things and now you know put them in a list for myself to to look over but uh like i said earlier in the interview there's you know weird things that happened to me so many years apart but starting in 2015 when i started on this healing path now amazing things happen to me every year and even lately it's like every month and yeah uh, yeah, I can tell you, you know, a couple of the things that like uh, that happened the following year in 2016 mm -hmm. um, when I was in uh, Hawaii for the retreat with Bridget. Uh, we were on the big island for one week and we were in Maui for one week. So it was a two week uh, retreat and, you know, it was a lot of money, but it, every penny was worth it. <laughs> yeah. I probably wouldn't be here right now if I didn't, you know. It was God sent that I even had the money to go to all these places in 13 months. You know, looking back, I don't know how I afforded all that. Um, but uh, so after spent, so we, we spent two weeks in Hawaii. We were swimming with whales, humpback whales, yeah. uh, multiple, multiple times. There's baby whales we saw. Uh, there was a manta ray that came right towards me and you know they're really intelligent they they're not like going up to you by accident and he started veering off and and i took a deep breath and i swam right alongside of them for you know however many seconds and and the dolphins and we were swimming with dolphins and turtles and just every day there was magic happening there was these uh twisters we went to the top of uh haleakala on the big island it's a dormant volcano it looks like mars up there it's like red sand and just so and you're above the clouds and uh i was just walking around and there were these twisters like a like a dust devil kind of that kept on appearing and disappearing but like a, a typical uh dust devil will be like you know like cone shaped right uh, like pointy at the bottom. These things were perfectly um, cylindrical, you know, like from the bottom to the top. And they were appearing behind me and like following me and then appearing in front of me. And I didn't even know this was going on, but one of my friends was watching it and uh, he was from Japan. And I go up to him and he goes, you have the dragon spirit, he said. I said, what? What are you talking about? He goes, uh, you have the dragon spirit. He's He can just tell by the way these things were like following me and stuff the energy it was just energy you know and so uh there were so many other things that happened so on the last night uh in there in hawaii i was walking back to my room with a friend of mine and uh 
I was just re recapping everything that happened. Uh, and so saying all these things, just like saying it now, is raising all of our vibration. Talking about swimming with whales and dolphins and having white owls what fly right by the car and look at everybody. Like it's it was raising my vibration. I was just recapping everything that happened to us. And then um, I said to myself, I was or to Rosanna, I said, uh, you know, this really is like the heart chakra of the planet. I I feel like my heart is really much more open now. And and then I just looked up to the sky and I spread my arms out and I said, and it's open for so much more. Right. And then I looked down and then my friend Rosanna, she gasped. She was like, oh, my God, <gasps> look at look at the lights. And so uh, I looked back up and right where like my head was looking when I, you know, said that to this guy, right comfortable, not down low or or behind me or above me, right in that spot where I was kind of like talking to, there was a triangle shaped lights. And I believe it was, well, I don't know if it was a very large ship with uh, three lights on the corner, like a triangle shaped ship, or it was three ships in a triangle formation. I'm not sure, but they were definitely like in space, like a height of a satellite, but all three lights were flashing really fast. And it was as if three different people had their hands on a switch and they were just randomly blinking on and off. And then the one light stopped and two remained and they were just blinking as one would go on, the other one would go off. And they were just doing it back and forth like that for maybe eight to 10 seconds. And then it stopped. And so we just were like, what the hell did we just see? And it was amazing, you know, to, to see something like that. And I was like, I just like say something to the sky. And, and then those lights appeared. <laughs> it was like crazy. But now I, I look back at that moment now and I didn't realize then, but now I realize, you know, we do have star family. It's not just me, you know, maybe everybody does, but I feel like they were celebrating. They were happy and they were celebrating what I said and what I was doing. Because if you look at my current situation at that time, it was less than a year where I was planning my death. How could I kill myself in the least painful way? So here I went to a retreat and then here I was at my second retreat and saying, hey, my heart is open now and I'm open for so much more, man. They were very happy. And so they they showed it. Hmm. Do you get any physical sensations when this happens? I mean, I guess it just it just feels super great for you. It just sounds like it feels really good. Yeah, but. yeah no physical uh -huh. sensations, but, you know, it was exciting to have that story because yeah. al although I was leaving the next day, we did meet with the group in the morning and went swimming with whales one more time before I went out um, uh, to the airport. But I did get to share that story with everybody in the group. And, you know, my friend Rosanna was sitting right next to me and she was a witness. So hearing, you know, from two people, you know, it's very believable when you hear, you know, someone sh uh, share a story and they have a witness, too. So it was nice to to share that story. And yeah, uh, an amazing confirmation. It's like um, the confirmation yeah. is so powerful. You can't you can't mm -hmm. deny it. You can't turn back. Right. So it's just a really nice, nice to have those confirmations. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like at the time uh, before this happened, I, I wasn't uh, looking to Bridget's retreat to connect or, or, or know anything about aliens. I, of course, I believed in them and I saw lots of UFOs, had time travel experience, but I wasn't attracted to her for those reasons because she did talk a lot about the hybrid children at the time. And, and so that wasn't even like a part of it. I just wanted the healing. And um, so I do remember her saying that doing what we were doing, uh, swimming with whales and dolphins, uh, she said it was preparing us for contact, you know, for future contact with aliens. And then here I have, you know, this experience with this UFO on the last day, I was really blown away. And, and I obviously knew it from that point that there's 
something else going on that you know people aren't aware of there there's so much more going on you know we do have spirits that are guiding us past loved ones ancestors we do have ets star family our future self our higher self you know there are we everybody has a plethora of people who help guide them and orchestrate their life, but they can't do it if people don't pay attention. They can't guide you as well if you don't believe in it and you don't talk to them and you don't pay attention. So since that time, since I've been really active in meditating a lot and and connecting with you know my higher self and and knowing that I'm divine and I don't really need any outside sources of of love, you know. You know, so since this is all gone about, I know you're at the point where you've decided to write your book and you're already started on that. Um, what resolutions have you made for your future outside of that? What what have you what are you what picture are you painting for the future now that you've discovered that you created create your own life? Well, I want to continue doing uh, working on retreats. I did host my own retreat uh, a few years ago, just awesome. with friends, yeah. um, but it was really successful. And um, you know, I've been a witness of some major healing. So I've I've discovered uh, through other people that I am a healer, and so that's something I want to continue doing: is hosting retreats or helping other people with their retreats. And uh, and probably being a speaker eventually one day too. So, on your timeline or or through all your experiences, you've come to decide what your mission is. Has it been fully revealed to you? Is it still being? Is it still unfolding? Uh, maybe there's some more things that are still be to 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 be revealed. But I mean, I know I'm a healer. I just. I didn't it take it took me time for people to convince me of that but I've seen enough and I've experienced enough to know that I am a healer and uh so that's really my mission is to help other people wake up and and to heal because it there's a connection between waking up and healing uh you know we need to to eat better you know to eat cleaner not have fluoride all the stuff that we talked about you know, so uh, we need to change our whole lifestyle uh, and, and wake up to what's really going on. You know, not just that there are aliens out there, but that we're being poisoned in, in many ways. So are you an activator? How, how in what capacity are you taking on the challenge of of helping people heal? Uh, just by sharing my wisdom, you know, sharing my stories and, you know, I can be specific to, to people, too. So when 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 one person might need to hear this, but the other person needs to hear that, you know, so like at retreats, I like to have one on one time with people and, and get to know them personally. And then I can help them a little better and guide them a little better. But what I what we're really teaching is, you know, we're not, you know, I call myself a healer, but I'm a facilitator of healing. We a conduit teach, even. Yeah. We we show people how to heal themselves. So I'm not right. really healing them. I'm sure I've healed myself. And so I'm and still working on it. But I help other people uh, learn how to heal themselves. Yeah. Well, that that's very honorable and it's it's very wise in the way that you point this out. Definitely, I can say that you share joy in a way that doesn't allow people to remain in self-pity, you know, like it's, it's contagious. So I really, yeah. I'm really looking forward to watching what you have on the horizon and the, and the pictures that you have to paint, seeing the retreats that you have and, and the book in the future. Um, any any other short term goals besides this that you'd like to share, or what's coming what's coming next? Um, well, I'm working on a retreat. Um, I'm helping Lily Nova host her mm -hmm. retreat um, in Mount Shasta, in Shasta next month. So I'll be uh, one of the facilitators on that project, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, there's going to be a lot going on where. Uh, we'll be going to a couple of conferences first, and then um, 
and then doing the retreat and we'll be hanging out with Lowell Johnson a little bit and uh yeah we'll Lowell, yeah taking us to some of his sacred places so oh you know, my god you're gonna travel <laughs> yeah who knows what's gonna be happening you know and then after all that we're gonna go up to East City in Washington where I've had phenomenal ufo experiences i can make we can make a whole nother video just at my experiences at east seti ranch yeah i saw that list is pretty tremendous um yeah and i haven't been able to go to east seti before i'm really i'm really looking forward to that one day hopefully hopefully yeah. he'll still be doing retreats i didn't, i didn't know if he seems like he has a lot of workshops going on on, on, on a lot of classes yeah. But you know it's uh, seasonal. But you can go there. There doesn't have to be an event. An event. Oh, um, really? You can go yeah. there and just uh, they have rooms that they rent, or you can pitch a tent and camp on the property. And uh, there's something extra magical about that land and that mountain that's there. It's Mount Adams. Uh, that's right. You know, it's 13 miles uh, from his property, but it looks it's so giant. It looks like it's right there in the backyard. And I can't I can't even tell you, you know, in in a short time how magical it is. But, but all I know is the two times that I've been there, I've had a, like a UFO experience the night before I went to East City. And after I got back home in New Jersey, the one year I had three experiences in one week. So that place has some extra magic that, you know, that you take home with you and maybe even get the day before you go. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard one person that, that went to East City that didn't have a story, a good right. one. And right. um, James, he puts out really good information over mm -hmm. the years. Um, yeah. I, I've yeah. really enjoyed him because he, he really teaches a lot on how to connect, how to ground and um, ET technology and things, that things that you could be doing, things that are at spas that people might not know is, is the passing on of technology that is here to help us, you mm -hmm. know, and, to, mm -hmm. and to help us move forward in the timeline. I am super appreciative of you taking the time and sharing with us. And sh we only got through maybe one and a quarter pages of his, <laughs> 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 but yeah, yeah. I was looking at that list. I was like, "Oh my god, we that that's like a four hours right there." <laughs> yeah, we can do part two, part three, part four, whatever we. Yeah, I'm looking do. forward to that, and I'm looking forward to getting to hang out with Lily more. You know, we we had her not that long ago, a time to spend with yep. her for the first time, and awesome. uh, that was extremely enjoyable. It's amazing for her to begin and be so dedicated to her journey, like just yeah. both feet yeah. in the water at that time. I'm not sure if Terry's able to hear or see because it's, it's, it's glitching in Canada. I thought I was going to be the one today because of all the rain. <laughs> yeah, she's in and out, but we know she's still there. Yeah, we know she's there. We know yeah. she's there. I don't know if, if you're waiting to put out information for people to contact you for more stories or you're just do you know the title of your book yet no not yet uh but people can just go on facebook and and messenger to to follow me just you know just make sure you spell my name right there it's g-a-r-t-n-e-r -E but you know I accept any questions you know um i love to talk to people i did do a video uh, like a week and a half ago on Facebook, and I talked for like 13 yes. minutes. I should have played that video. Oh, uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's, uh, you know, I, like I repeated it. a lot of what I said in the video I repeated today. Um, but it it uh, spawned lots of conversations. I was having conversations with people for days after that, and I just really enjoyed it, and I loved it. So, yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer you. Yeah, actually, one day when we did Terry Tuesday, we showed your video. Right. Yep, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, without sound. <laughs> so I, I do want to just show it. Ah, Robert! <laughs> We're going to leave some of my stories, some interesting things that have been happening to me lately. And it's really been happening to me a lot over the last nine years. And it's about time I made a video and shared some of it. I'm an experiencer, and that's someone who experiences paranormal things. Um, 
And uh, uh, I have a range and with of that, wide categories of things that have on. been happening to me my whole That's life. Right. Hi, everybody. And then There's we Randy. end up at my local mm. park, and I wanted to capture all the pretty purple flowers um, that are out. It's spring. Um, but I wanted to do a video uh, along with what Rob Gardner did. <laughs> he made a video. He's my friend. And he disclosed his experiences that uh, he's had that has happened to him in his lifetime. And um, today is Memorial Day. And we need to remember those who have sacrificed or um, did their service, you know, so we could, you know, be free. And that is a big part of this is yes our sacred sovereignty on this planet, mm -hmm. knowing where we're from and, and what's going on around us and freeing ourselves from. Yeah. You know, medical tyranny and freeing yes. ourselves from these jobs and these mortgages and all, everything just yeah. and, and living our best life, freeing ourselves from the pain of our past because uh, people aren't really understanding or knowing why they're in so much pain. I mean, and that not that the reason why people are using drugs and using alcohol? And yeah. so this is this is really what it's all about is finding freedom and a lot of times we can't even walk in our sovereignty and we're wondering why people are so miserable because we're actually living in a whole lie. So it's it's going to be hard to find joy when when everything around us is not exactly what it's supposed to be or not what it's presented as. So I appreciate you, Randy, Terry, and everybody who um, watches let us know what you think and how you feel. And if you have a story and you want to tell a story or if you just want to reach out to Robert, Randy, me or Terry and just um, let's get the ball rolling in, right. this, in this journey to the truth, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's so cool that you keep wearing that you wear this shirt and you, I see you got the poster in the background. Yeah, he's yeah. And he's a fan. He's a fan, y'all. If you don't know Kendrick right. Lamar. <laughs> it, it's a journey to the truth so it is a let's journey begin. let's begin let's begin terry any words if you can it'll sound like a hip-hop record like <laughs> <laughs> it'll sound like you're djing you're present any words terry all right <laughs> she's like Nod and wave, nod and wave. Okay. No. <laughs> no words. Okay. She's like, I'm not even doing it anymore. Can you, can you type it? <laughs> I, I'm glitching so bad. I can't. I can't. I, I got lots to say, but. <laughs> All right. No I'm problem. Sorry. She was a good mental support. You were, yeah, holding the space. That's what they call it, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Erica. Have a great night.